Thomas Goldston. We can all read and we heard Dr. Simi Severick say it. I'm here to tell everyone about medical physics. So, uh, unsatisfactory definition out of the way. Uh, always have to talk about what is medical physics, the use of physics in medicine. Uh, it's kind of the boring answer. You probably, I mean, you probably heard it from Dr. Dugas if you came to his talk. And uh, if anyone would ever say, well, that just sounds like you're saying physics is everywhere in medicine, I would probably just give them a smug grin <laughs> and say yes. Um, specifically today, we're going to be talking about uh, how physics is used in medicine in relation to uh, ionizing radiation, and that's for uh, not only therapeutic, uh, reducing tumors as well as reducing any other uh, problematic tissues, but also for imaging and diagnosis. So wanted to talk about the origins of medical physics and who I consider to be the father of medical physics, and that would be uh, Wilhelm Röntgen. And <clears throat> he, like most scientists back in the 1890s, was just toying around with a cathode ray tube 23 hours out of the day. So <clears throat> kind of to mention uh, somebody else who worked on cathode ray tubes back in the day, uh, just thought this was interesting. Uh, <laughs> Another Goldstein, so I think we've been working on this for quite some time. So, yeah, here's, if, if you don't remember your, you know, chemistry class where they probably talked about it, this is a cathode ray tube. You have uh, what they call back in the day cathode rays because they didn't realize it was this electron beam. And you can see how he's using a magnet to actually uh, deflect that beam. And so, uh, Rompton worked with this extensively in how he came to his conclusions. So uh, I'm sure everyone can read this paper, so we're just gonna go through it line by line. Um, so he published this, it, it's called a, uh, On a New Kind of Rays in 1896. He published this with Nature. Really fascinating article. Honestly, it's kind of creepy if you read it because it sounds like he just has all the answers before he starts his experiment. I mean, honestly, it just sounds like he's hitting triple cherries on the slot machine with every step of his experiment. Everything just works out perfectly for him. Uh, people had done uh, similar experiments with the cathode ray tube before him, but uh, he just decided to change it up in a few facets, and uh, it really worked out for him. <clears throat> so, uh, a few things. I don't know if he knew the weight of what he was saying at the time. Uh, I mean, he clearly knew that it was an impactful discovery to discover these x-rays from this cathode ray tube, but I don't know if he knew the impact that some of these statements would actually hold. Uh, I really like this one here. It says, it is readily shown that all bodies possess the same transparency, but in very varying degrees. And this is honestly a great way to summa uh, do a summation of what medical physics actually is. So <clears throat> so the use of the word bodies there means not so, just physical bodies, but human bodies, or did the, I mean, bodies would mean any object, actually. Any object, right. So, so he's not specifically even speaking medical. Yeah, no, no. So uh, in his experiments, he actually showed, uh, well, first off, he had to discover that there were unidentified rays coming out of the side of this cathode ray tube that he didn't initially predict, and he called those X-rays. Uh, initially, he predicted that he would see a flare out of the uh, opposite end, the anode side of his cathode ray tube, and uh, that was because he was having his cathode ray uh, hit an aluminum target and even the glass target on the other end. And he predicted to see a flare on the end. And he actually replicated uh, previous experiments done by uh, Heinrich Hertz and Philip Leonard. Um, but he made a few improvements, uh, which I wouldn't necessarily say he kind of knew from the start there would be improvements. He was kind of just trying things out and, in my opinion, got really lucky and made some really important discoveries. Uh, so, he wrapped his cathode ray tube in a material that it would not allow these cathode rays, what they legitimately thought were rays at the time. The, uh, there were a lot of people who uh, guesstimated, especially in the UK physicist department, that these were actually charged particles, uh, which was later seen by the ability to deflect them with magnets or charged plates, as J.J. Thompson did in his experiment when he discovered the charge to mass ratio. But Rompton, actually a few years before any of that, was working with these, and he noticed that even after wrapping this cathode ray tube, he was getting fluorescing crystals on his desk 
And if you put targets or screens around his room, uh, you could say, you know, perpendicular or to the side of his cathode ray tube, he would actually see emissions from it. And he even used a uh, phosphorus screen that he could place objects in front of. And that's where you, you see this, all bodies possess some level of transparency. Um, he would note that very thick metals, uh, like very importantly, he discovered uh, lead was a great attenuator um, of the time. And so these would show up very dark on these screens that he would project. But he tried a number of things. He tried decks of cards, you know, his wife's hand, anything, you know, you just feel like throwing in the middle of some x-rays. Um, and so uh, I thought this was really important. It shows that he was uh, enclosing his cathode ray tube in a uh, very dark, thick black paper that he didn't expect to have any cathode rays leave. That's why he predicted that this, this is actually a new um, array or uh, you know, part of the uh, light spectrum. And he used this uh, barium platinum cyanide phosphorus screen. And this was actually important because in the previous experiment done by Heinrich Hertz and Philip Leonard, they didn't actually see some of these uh, attenuations from the side of their ray tube because they were using uh, phosphorus screens which uh, had much lower Z value materials uh, in the compounds. So that actually kind of helps lead you to discover that using higher Z materials will actually lead to higher attenuation and that's why he was able to see so much more on his screen. So I kind of want to talk about uh, how this actually pertains to revolutionizing medicine because we have a lot of cool physics but how does this actually help us in medicine? So uh, importantly, Ronkin actually was looking at lead discs through his x-ray screen, and that's when he actually noticed his bones, and he thought, you know, instead of sticking my hand in here, this might be dangerous, I'll probably get my wife over here. And uh, so she stuck her hand on this film for 15 minutes, and that's where the famous first uh, x-ray film image came from, or the uh, Ronkinogram, or Ronkinograph, they call it. So um, this was really important, this text right here. It shows that the cathode ray tube could be deflected by a magnet, suggesting that these are actually charged particles. But he noted that these unidentified rays that he called x-rays were not able to be deflected by a magnet, suggesting that they aren't charged particles and they might be a new spectrum of light such as they'd seen with ultraviolet or infrared before. Um, this was also really important because this helped him discover that these x-rays are actually emitting where the cathode ray tubes are smacking into their target. And the way he did this is by um, deflecting this cathode ray with a magnet and seeing that the actual origin of the x-rays would shift and stay consistent with the uh, location of where the cathode rays were striking the target. Um, so this is kind of like less scientific, but I think a really cool video on old x-ray film back in the day uh, fluoroscopy of a uh, guy playing trumpet. So you can see, I'm, I'm pretty sure this film was actually done in the 1970s. And I mean, think about like back then you could already get that much uh, detail. Uh, it's actually incredible. Um, so <laughs> not to offend anyone. Um, so uh, I think I have my famous legendary quote from Dr. Semisovich himself. This is a bit paraphrased, but he used to say in our medical physics class, you know, a physician could always ask his patient for information. You know, does your foot hurt? Do you have a stomach ache? Do you have headaches? You know, how do you feel? But what does a veterinary uh, doctor ask their patient? They can't ask them anything. And so it, it just goes to show the leaps and bounds that uh, x-rays and this new ionizing radiation as a method of imaging can provide. And I wanted to show that off with this really cool video some people took of a dog actually feeding. This is another uh, x-ray video. And it, it's really incredible the anatomical detail you can get. So uh, maybe on a less brighter note, kind of getting into the fun grittiness of uh, medical physics and some of its darker pasts. Um, this guy right here was from Chicago and he was actually the first to use uh, these new x-rays as a form of uh, therapy to cancer. And uh, <laughs> like I said, this guy has a pretty dark past. Uh, he actually started doing this within a year of Ronkin's paper 
being published. So his paper was published in like late 1896 or some order, and uh, he started doing these uh, therapy projects on patients in 1897, 1898. And uh, he was another fiddler of the cathode ray tube, kind of cathode ray tube enjoyer. And he actually had a eureka moment, I guess, that they could be used to treat cancer because he was discovering burns on his hands after working with the cathode ray tube all day and discovering that it was from the x-rays being admitted. And uh, so this guy worked with a few patients, and uh, let's just say that he made people write a biography about him, and they didn't like him. He, he didn't have a good go of it. But some people who contributed to using radiation and therapy that are loved by everyone, great accomplishments, that would be Mary and Pierre Curie. So they actually uh, discovered radioactivity and were a huge impact in using radium to uh, reduce these tumor sizes. They helped a lot of people over the years. So now I kind of want to talk about how medical physics has changed. We've seen all the old cool stuff. Uh, I, I could have even shown some images in here. They used to have teletherapy machines, which were uh, would, would look nice on the inside, but are ultimately just a lead tube with a cobalt source in it that they would point in the general direction of the patient. Um, but we've come a long way from just uh, kind of uh, doctors holding the cathode ray tube over their patient and hoping to reduce the tumor size. Um, so on the right here, uh, these are all photos that I took from my internship at KLS Physics. Um, on the top there is actually a PET CT being put together. The front portion is the uh, computed tomography portion, the CT scanner, and the back portion is the PET scanner. So the way this system would work is the patient would be scanned with this CT and that would get very high resolution of the anatomical structure of the patient. And then they would also take up a radionuclide and that would actually have positron electron annihilation and it would emit the opposing 511 KEV photons. And this PET scanner would actually pick both of those up at a time from its detectors, 360 degrees and use tomography software to make an image out of it. So the PET provides excellent functionality because you'll have these sources like 4 and 18 FDG being taken up very highly in these uh, tumorous cells, or you can even have like thallium or technetium that's really good at collecting in dead heart tissue and seeing actually how people's hearts are doing after uh, heart attacks and other sorts. And speaking of heart attacks, this bottom left scanner right here is actually uh, part of the SPECT camera. So it's different from PET in that it's singular photon emission uh, computed tomography. So it's not actually going to read both of those photons at the same time. It kind of just reads whatever it gets. And this uh, one on the left is used a lot in cardiology clinics. You'll see it everywhere for stress and de-stress uh, measurements. And on the right is a little bit more advanced of a SPECT camera. Um, we also have a mammography unit right here that I'd like to display. This is actually interesting because it uses many of the same principles as radiographic installations, but also uses uh, tomographic installations. And this actually uh, unit can tilt about 15.75 degrees to either side. And uh, that's usually the number. I don't know why 0.75, but- uh, It's not 16. Can, yeah, yeah. It costs you an extra 100,000 bucks. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> so you can make a lot of slices out of that and get a 3D image. Uh, mammography actually has some of the lowest doses and highest spatial resolution in all of uh, medical imaging because you have to have really high dose, uh, really high uh, spatial resolution, really good spatial uh, resolution to see the calcifications that uh, form in women's breasts that they're often scanning for. And you don't want a high dose because women have to get these scans quite often. And here we have uh, ultrasound unsung hero of the medical physics community. I actually love these things. Uh, these actually use the transmission and reflection of very high frequency waves through the body to uh, form an image in real time. It's a lot like the fluoroscopy uh, videos we watched of the trumpet player and the dog. And this is really helpful for looking at uh, people's uh, outer tissues for abscesses or obviously checking in on the condition of an unborn child. So, Kind of talk a little bit about some of the imaging techniques went over those. I'd also like to mention some of the therapeutic techniques. So right here we have a photo from uh, the Photon Therapy Center at Willis Knight and Shreveport. Dr. Simi Svig in our class actually treated us to an awesome, awesome field trip up there. And we got to see this thing in person as well as the proton accelerator they have in the back. And this is uh, really, really impactful stuff. It's really cool. 
it's, it's sad to see that because it's so expensive, insurance companies often won't allow their patients to get it, and that's one of the major drives keeping this thing from taking off. Um, but protons are really impactful because you have that brag peak where they slow down, and that's where you have an increase in, in attenuation. And it's, it, it's really, really helpful for irradiating the uh, head and neck of children, pediatric patients, without over penetrating too much and having too much uh, attenuation in the vital organs of children as well. Um, brachytherapy. Brachytherapy is really cool. It's kind of just taken off everywhere. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about what types of brachytherapy they have. Uh, this image actually shows uh, radioisotopes being planted as seeds into a prostate of a prostate cancer patient, and these will likely stick with this person long term, if not life. Um, this was probably the coolest named one that is in, in existence. This is the Dama Knife. This thing's sick. Um, so Dama Knife, uh, it's kind of funny because it's pretty rudimentary. It, it looks pretty awful, actually, but the name is awesome. So I, I have a special place in my heart for it. This is exactly what it looks like. It's literally just, you know, the shower head that your grandma and mom go to dry their hair at after the salon but they just stick like 216 cobalt sources in here and uh, literally just collimate these sources like the old teletherapy machines. But the nice thing is you can actually choose which ones are collimating um, and uh, so you can actually get a lot of different degrees and have that kind of add up. So it's tungsten or lead? Huh? The polymation is it tungsten or? Uh, no, so they would have to go in uh, before procedure. I've actually never gotten to see one of these in person. But you would have to, uh, I don't know, they actually vary a lot in, uh, you know, uh, some of the newer ones look a little bit less torturous like this one does. But you would have to, uh, I believe, manually remove some of that collimation to allow that penetration. Um, and a lot of these are now being paired with CTs just like the PET are. Um, I've never gotten to see one, but they have one in Shreveport, so. Is that therapeutic or is that imaging? Yeah, that's therapeutic. That is meant to reduce brain tumors. They have one at LSU Medical Center. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think they, I can't remember if they do Cobalt 57 or 60 in those. I'd have to ask my brother. I think 60, but I'm not sure. Um, so this is like overview of what we kind of talked about. We've got radiographic, fluoroscopic. Radiographic is kind of what you saw from the rontinographs or however you want to call them. Like the old picture, you literally just have a film or nowadays what we use is digital detectors to intercept these exoskeletons. <coughs> And this is just going to take still images. You'll probably have 20 of them in your life looking for broken bones or maybe tuberculosis in the chest and whatnot. Uh, fluoroscopic is actually really interesting. That's going to be used a lot in your surgeries. I've actually done a lot of shielding calculations for various uh, fluoroscopy installations, and they use them a lot for uh, spine surgical centers so that they can get a better look at what they're doing without being as intrusive. And then computed tomography also gets used a lot. It's a little bit more expensive. The dose is actually pretty high compared to everything else, but you get a really, really good image. And it's 3D, you, you get a lot of slices there, and there's a ton of techniques. I know they're coming out with a new one now that uh, only a few installations have called a photon counting uh, CT, and that's supposed to be really exciting, but I don't know all the details. Um, talked already about mammography. Nuclear medicine kind of covers a lot. Um, you're going to see nuclear medicine anytime there's a PET facility because that relies on taking an isotope up um, for those PET CT uh, spec cameras. Most of the time you're going to see fluorine 18 FDG or like rubidium 82 or um, you know technetium 99M. Um, and then of course outside of the ionizing radiation umbrella you have ultrasound and magnetic resonance imaging or MRI. Uh, so, kind of, I'm not the best person to talk about therapeutic because I focus mainly in diagnostic, but I thought it was important to at least go over. Um, you kind of have two thoughts of process for therapeutic. You have either have ex uh, external beam therapy, so you're going to be shooting some type of particle at it, someone either that's, you know, beta, or maybe you'll do a very high energy x-ray in comparison to what we use in diagnostic, um, or you'll use something more advanced like proton, but that's from a beam externally, or you'll have you know, like the gamma knife, you'll have uh, radioactive sources externally. Whereas brachytherapy, like we mentioned earlier, had the prostate seeds in. And so there's two types of brachytherapy. There's HDR and LDR. So uh, you can read what they mean there. And basically high dose rate means you're gonna have a really high activity source and that's gonna be planted in the patient 
for maybe just like a couple hours at most. That's not long term at all. It's meant for short, sporadic, high energy sessions um, that you do over a long period of time potentially. Whereas low dose rate is literally, they're sticking in lower activity and longer half-life isotopes inside of you that are meant to stay in for years, maybe even the rest of your life. Um, so this is kind of showing off how a uh, typical radiographic unit looks. They'll have like, a, they call them wall buckies or ch uh, chest buckies, like uh, digital sensors on the wall. But they'll also have these in the table and this uh, arm that goes on a rail will take an image uh, using attenuation and you can see this guy's broken arm. <clears throat> this is a pretty good diagram showing off how x-ray tubes look nowadays. They look really similar to cathode ray tubes back in the day, but these are actually how x-ray tubes or x-rays are produced. And a, a really big discovery that people made, you know, because before, uh, Rockin actually didn't even know that um, he, he could get more uh, x-rays produced from a higher uh, uh, Z material like a tungsten or something like that. So he would actually just use glass or people started using platinum in their x-ray uh, tube producers. But now we use metal almost all the time. You'll use like tungsten or something of the sorts. But we can actually see how this anode that's made of tungsten is actually a disc, and this disc will rotate very quickly, and that's actually a really important uh, advancement because now you have a greater surface area and you won't have as uh, many problems heating as you're constantly bombarding that surface with uh, uh, electron beams. So uh, I can't explain every detail about this, don't even have the time to, but this is really, really awesome. Uh, films here showing off how a computed uh, tomography CT kind of works in a nutshell. Uh, you're taking this attenuation as a function of the angle and if you take a ton of those images you can use tomographic software that creates uh, 3D artificial images and slices that can be sorted through for some really incredible images. And you can see uh, in the top right here the resolution on this is absolutely outstanding. A similar thing is used in uh, PET CT, like we talked about earlier. This uh, graphic is actually really awesome, showing how these uh, positron uh, electron annihilations are happening when these particles come to a stop and emitting these uh, opposing gamma photons to conserve momentum and being detected by this 360 degree wrap detector. But you'll notice. Oh, Um, so you'll notice uh, really interesting uh, the resolution on this is not that great That's why they often pair CT with it because you can get that functionality from the pet Where you have an isotope that is specifically being uptake into um, a tissue area of uh, interest But then you also have a CT composite image that gives you that really crisp anatomical structure um, Talking a little bit about ultrasound like I said ultrasound is really cool going to have super high frequency uh, uh, sound waves and these are going to be uh, transmuted through the body and the transmission and reflection of these waves it actually forms uh, real-time images so you kind of get a video and uh, you'll often see them uh, use jelly that's to try and create an impedance that is close to tissue that way you have greater transmission and you're not just getting all your ultrasounds reflected into your face before they even get in the person um, so that's why that jelly is actually there and Something that's really cool is using ultrasound as therapy. I know there's a few things I don't really know about about using therapy for like, you know, just in general, but specific stuff that like definitely does work is things like uh, breaking up kidney stones. You can actually modify the wavelength of this uh, ultrasound beam uh, or ultrasound wave to be uh, such that it resonates in whatever kidney stone size you have and that resonance will cause the kidney stone to break up and allows people to pass kidney stones that are normally too big to pass and would otherwise in, uh, require intrusive surgery. So MRI, definitely the most complicated of the imaging techniques. Um, MRI uses a really, really powerful uh, magnetic field and it sends a radio frequency pulse across all of these protons and electrons that are aligning with this field and it causes them to actually process um, kind of like a spinning top that's being affected by gravity. It wants to fall over on its side, but its angular momentum is causing it to process. And this procession time actually can be used to form an image. And I've got a pretty cool video here. If you ever wonder if medical physicists work hard, no, we just stick non-ferromagnetic metals inside of MRIs and kind of play around with them. Um, 
So that's exactly what uh, Adam from my job is doing here. Like the soundtrack. Yeah. Yeah, MRIs are actually extremely loud. Most patients wear uh, earbuds. than other imaging devices because uh, if you act like an antenna in that giant uh, coil system you can actually burn up pretty fast people do uh, MRI burns it can be pretty brutal and also you know if you go in there with some type of aneurysm clip or something and you know you make it through that can be really awful so that's why they have to scan you to make sure you're not ferromagnetic before you go in so um, I kind of already talked about this, so I'll probably just uh, skim through this, uh, talking about uh, high dose rate, low dose rate for AG therapy. Um, this is uh, something I really wanted to talk about in this, is uh, units of measurement for radiation. Uh, a lot of times, you know, you might hear 3.6 Rumpton on a TV show and wonder actually, uh, you know, is that dangerous? How much is that? What is a Rumpton? So activity is actually gonna tell you for these uh, radioactive isotopes, the rate of decay or how many decays or disintegrations per second are occurring. The SI unit for that is the Becquerel, although you will almost never hear someone list activity of an isotope in Becquerel unless they're from Australia. That's about it. Um, other than that, you're going to hear curies or some people, you know, depending on how southern you are, will say mites for millicuries. And one curie is defined as the activity of one gram of radium-226 and that's equal to 37 billion becquerels. Um, and so exposure tells us the uh, ionization potential of the ionizing radiation, and this is the potential to free charge from a spe specified mass. Almost always you're gonna hear exposure in terms of air. And same with uh, using dose rate for gray. Um, so exposure, actually you can convert directly to dose as long as you're talking about the same material. Uh, which is commonly done for uh, air. So the SI unit is just one coulomb per kilogram, but most people are always gonna use Ronkin, which has kind of a complicated conversion. Uh, you can generally divide your Ronkin by 114 and get your dose rate in milligray. Now gray is actually gonna end up being the uh, SI unit, and gray and Siebert, unlike the other units, uh, the SI units are way more common than the uh, U.S. units, pretty much you won't hear people saying rat or rim too much unless they're really old in the business now. Um, Gray and Seabird are the cool kids in town. So these actually tell how much uh, energy is being deposited per unit mass. And so uh, Gray is kind of more of a specific, easy to measure dose rate, whereas Seabird takes in a few very hard to calculate, usually approximated untangibles like know how effective is this radiation towards that uh, human tissue or how susceptible is that human tissue to that radiation um, most of the time you're going to hear dose rate in gray although sometimes if you're doing an after action report like a fetal dose calculation after a pregnant woman has been scanned you'll specifically do sieverts and do detailed calculations um, sievert is really useful for if someone gets a uniform uh, field of radiation in their face like watching Chernobyl or watching a bomb you can actually see uh, what tissues are most likely to be damaged and by how much and also what kind of effect the type of radiation is going to be. So generally the radiation weighting factor for x-rays and gamma rays is just going to be one, but that factor goes up crazy high. If you're using alpha particles, it's times 20. So I mean, this alpha particles would be 20 times more effective at destroying tissue than x-rays or gamma rays. Um, and Neutrons obviously depend on their kinetic energy as to how effective they are. Honestly, this tissue weighting factor, very rarely used. This is kind of like I said, just if you were to get hit with uniform radiation, uh, how would your different tissues be affected as a uh, whole body radiation? Um, so one thing I kind of want to talk about is uh, how much radiation is dangerous and how can we know that? So 
Uh, radiation hormesis has kind of been an idea that's been around for a long time. There's a lot of studies to back it up, but you know, uh, I wouldn't I wouldn't call it a done deal so far. But uh, a lot of people do believe that a small amount of radiation is actually healthy for you, like background levels, like 30 micro octan per hour. Um, and so obviously the danger of radiation is well known. It can cause cancer, or uh, if you get uh, very high doses in a very short amount of time, you can get uh, very horrible symptoms like uh, blood poisoning or toxification of the blood, sepsis, uh, bone marrow destruction, uh, you know, uh, diarrhea, et cetera. It's, it's not good. And so most radiation safety protocols follow ALARA. ALARA says as low as reasonably achievable. Technically, you could just put 30 feet thick of lead around every installation, and you would read no, you would read no radiation at all. Uh, you know, you would read background, and that's it. But that's not really practical. Uh, at the end of the day, the m money does drive this world, unfortunately. So you have to make safe approximations, and so that's where as low as reasonably achievable comes in. So this is kind of the end of my talk. I don't know how much time I have left, but. Um, I did want to gloss over uh, kind of medical physics as a career. Medical physics is very financially sound. You can make a lot of money in this business. Um, so uh, AAPM actually reports a medium salary, median salary of 200K per year as long as you're board certified. And that's regardless of master's versus PhD. The payment they list is actually not that different between the two. Um, and so it, it's really gratifying because you're using your knowledge of physics in a very practical, real-time uh, application manner. So, you know, if you're working in a clinic, uh, if you do your job correctly, the results of, you know, the fruits of your labor are right there. Uh, you don't, you know, you don't have to wait for it to be shown. And so uh, also, if you, you know, if you're interested in research, it is the medical field. So there's constantly grant money flowing in and the field is, innovating and inventing something new every single day. So kind of the track you would have to go after obtaining a bachelor's degree in a physics uh, major or some other related field, you would have to attend a CAMPEP accredited university and become board certified. There are a lot of things you can do in the medical physics world without even having a physics degree or being board certified, but as the days go by, you're gonna need those certifications. It is kind of a thing that is going in the past. Um, and they, they really help you a lot. So I, I definitely recommend you going for that ADR board certification if you're gonna go down this path. And uh, I definitely recommend uh, visiting Tampa uh, and their website. If you're gonna to go to a program, you have to go to one of their programs. These are uh, three part exams. I mean, compared to like, what, what is it, the actuaries, those exams are supposed to be really nasty. Yeah, right? it's, so, um, you know, I, I haven't taken any parts of them, so I can't say from experience, but uh, yeah, they are pretty hard and the schooling is pretty hard. It's pretty expensive. You know, you have to do a two year residency. And I think that's a lot of the reason why medical physics gets paid a lot is because you kind of have to go through a lot of this training and schooling that otherwise people might not be willing to go through even though there's a huge need for the field. Uh, it is something nice about medical physics. If you do become board certified, you get your degree and you do your residency, you make it through those bottlenecks, then uh, it's you kind of choose where you want to go because there's a need for you everywhere and medical physicists usually are getting work overworked. Uh, I mean, I'm in some uh, listservs for medical physicists and people are constantly just begging other people to come work with them so they would have a lot of workload. Um, so it, job security is not a problem. <coughs> The important uh, organizations are uh, obviously Camp Up we talked about, and AAPM is like the big organization, the American <coughs> Association of Physicists and Medicine. Uh, you also have uh, the ACR, uh, American College of Radiation, uh, them and NCRP, National Council on Radiation Protection. They're very pinnacle in setting the rules in uh, how medical physicists operate. So if you want to keep up to date with how medical physicists have to do their job, those, those are the places you want to go. Uh, so here I kind of have just my sources and any questions?